Hey, welcome back to 316, a Bible study of Bridgeway Church. My name is Joel Eason. I'm the senior pastor at Bridgeway, and uh, welcome to this study. If you're new with us, I hope you've taken a moment to check out our channel. We'd love to have you check out some of the other studies that we've done as we've gone through a variety of the New Testament books and even the Old Testament prophets. And if you're unfamiliar with our church, we'd love to have you check us out at www.bridgeway.tv. For our regulars, welcome back. We're thrilled that you're here, and uh, we're going to go ahead and hop over to our regular look. We are uh, going to be in uh, the book of Luke. We started this in our last time together. And uh, we said from the beginning, uh, when we look back at the Gospel of Matthew and we look at the Gospel of Mark, uh, we said that there were different intended audiences or initial audiences uh, out of these particular Gospels. And so uh, one of the things that we looked at with uh, Matthew, he is often argued to be the first Gospel. Mark is also argued. It's those two that are... Uh, would have been close in proximity and time range. We've looked at that. Uh, but Matthew certainly was writing to a Jewish audience. He's writing in the town of Antioch, which was not Jewish, uh, but he was writing with that context to Jewish people. And uh, so he is often depicting uh, the gospel showing or highlighting Jesus as the Messiah. Mark, who is influenced by uh, the Apostle Peter, or the disciple Peter, uh, he is writing what it, scholars typically hold from uh, the Roman region, and uh, he would have been writing to Gentiles uh, about Jesus as God's servant. Well, when we look at Luke, as we started last week, uh, he is writing to Gentile readers uh, as well, uh, specifically Gentile readers abroad, and he is coming from uh, the region of Syria. He would have been uh, an Antioch, born and raised at least in, in Antioch. And, um, and so what we know about uh, Luke, and we, we leaned on this in our first study, is uh, he was a companion of Paul coming out of Antioch of Syria. Uh, we also know that he is the only Gentile author within the scriptures, and we know of his profession. Uh, his education and skill set that he was a physician and a couple passages that we have here from Galatians chapter 4 uh, depicting our dear friend Luke the doctor and then also 2 Timothy chapter 4 when when Paul writes to his son in the faith Timothy that only Luke is with me and Demas um, he's going to also depict Demas being there but we know 2 Timothy chapter 4 happens at the tail end and near the very end of Paul's life. And there's also a dating. Most scholars will hold that, uh, that uh, the Apostle Paul was martyred somewhere around 64-65 AD. And uh, so we have a, a framework of, of Paul and Luke's association and timeline together. We find him all through the book of Acts. In fact, Luke is the author of the gospel of Luke and of the book of Acts. And so uh, in Luke chapter 1, he writes, It seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Uh, most hold that Theophilus was an individual person and not a group of people. Now, the argument and the disparity around that arises from uh, the name Theophilus comes from two compounds. You know, it's coming from Theo being God and then Philo, Philo or uh, where we would get Philadelphia, we would get love. Um, and uh, so you would have lover of God. Um, and, uh, but most hold that Theophilus is an individual that most likely had Luke in his employment, and uh, he writes Luke chapter 1 as a, as a first part, and then the book of Acts is a second part of his writings. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So there's a lot that we can pull from the person of Luke as well as his contributions in the scripture. 
Now, just kind of a summary of where we were last time together. We looked at Luke chapter 1, and we did a little more exhaustive uh, introduction to the letter than I've done. Um, I mentioned last time that uh, the, the Gospel of Luke is is highlighted by people that are well-versed in uh, classical Greek, that it is one of the most well-written uh, historical writings in the language of Greek because of its sophistication, its grammar usage. Um, I don't personally speak Greek, but I know how to find and study words within it. But for those that are well-versed in the language itself, um, they often highlight that this is one of the most well-crafted writings of Greek literature ever. Um, and uh, you'll find that his sophistication shows up in uh, some of the terms that he uses. For instance, we leaned last time that he said uh, that he gives, receives account from eyewitnesses. But he doesn't use a common word. He uses a medical word, uh, toptes, where we would get the word aut autopsy. Um, and so he'll, he'll often use medical terms that are very sophisticated in order to describe something. But we looked in Luke chapter 1 from the introduction to the angel's announcement to, uh, about John the Baptist. This was to his parents or specifically to his father, Zechariah. We talked about his name. We talked about the name of Elizabeth and what they meant. And uh, then the announcement that came to Mary, Mary's going to visit Elizabeth, there's going to be a song that Mary gives, and then John the Baptist will be born, and Zechariah will have a song as his tongue is loosed and he's able to declare the praises of the Lord. So with that, looking at what we're covering today, uh, as we've talked about, anytime you have more than 20 chapters uh, to go through in the span of, you know, we've got 10 sessions together, uh, including this one. Um, it, it's a, it can be a bit challenging. So we're going to go through chapters 2, 3, and 4, and we're going to kind of like be a rock skipping along the water. If you were to look at chapters 2, 3, and 4, these are the components that you would find in these chapters. Uh, Jesus' birth in, in Bethlehem, the shepherds and the angels, and all that you and I would know of the Christmas story. Uh, and then following that, in verse 21 of chapter 2, Jesus is presented at the temple. We know the story, and we're going to see it, uh, when Jesus is 12 years old being found in the temple. In chapter 3, it's really going to center on two things, and that's going to be the ministry of John the Baptist, and then secondly, Jesus being baptized in his genealogy. I'll share a couple words about that as we go along. And then chapter 4, we'll have the temptation of Jesus where Satan tempts him, and then Jesus will read the scroll And in Nazareth. He'll read from the Isaiah scroll. And uh, then he'll find his way to Capernaum and the Galilee area. He'll cast out an evil spirit. Many will end up being healed, and uh, and his ministry will will thrive in tremendous ways. So that's a general look at chapter two, three, and four. So we're going to dive into a couple things here. Um, so the Christmas story that you and I know about, uh, Luke chapter two. Uh, verses 1 through 7, and I'll make some comments at the end of it. It says, uh, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. Now, Real quick, I just want you to understand that there is a tremendous amount of historical context here. So just like if you and I were to write a handwritten letter or even an email or text, if we were wanting someone to know some context, context of time, context of city, we would articulate that. Well, in the context of time, the way that ancient documents would um, would cite the timeline would often be by events or what was most common leaders whoever was ruling at a time 
because the rulers kept annals, the annals of a city or the annals of a king. And so you could define timeline according to rulers. And so uh, Luke does something here in depicting uh, that very same kind of context. Now, before we read forward anymore, let me show you something about Caesar Augustus, because this, this gives us some timeline um, where scholars are able to say, okay, this is probably happening somewhere around 29 uh, BC uh, to 27 BC. There's some, some push, you know, uh, in a variety of different regards, but let me show you something. So what you're looking at here is a map of the Roman Empire. Um, but you'll see right beside my picture, you'll see some different colors with some different dates. Um, it's important to remember historically, not just scripturally, but historically, Caesar Augustus um, did not come into power very easily or with warm welcome. So what you had in the way of the Roman Republic, so the Roman Republic was established 500 B.C., and it operated as a republic for centuries. You fast forward all the way to Julius Caesar and you study the history of Julius Caesar and there was a lot of push on him and uh, in becoming a ruler of what would be like a king, but he never wanted to take the title king. And, um, and so one of the things about Rome was this defense of becoming a kingdom ruled by a king or an empire ruled by emperors. And so um, you have Julius Caesar who is assassinated. We know famously the Ides of March and the famous, you know, uh, assassination of Julius Caesar happens around 44 BC. Well, it, in his post-humanistly uh, documents and wishes and whatnot, um, his great uh, his great nephew, uh, whose name was Octavian Gaius Octavian, was to be adopted as his son. That would eventually become Caesar Augustus. So Gaius Octavian is adopted into the family of Julius Caesar, and he will eventually become uh, powerful. But the Senate controlled Rome. And uh, so the first title that uh, Octavian takes is not Caesar Augustus. The first title that he takes is, uh, it was said, Princeps Civiatus, Princeps Civiatus, and it simply meant the first citizen. It was one that had some measures of authority um, on behalf of the citizens and would all, was also not separate from the citizens. Like the real fear of a king or an emperor is that they're separate from the citizens. So uh, Gaius Octavian is the one that suggests this title. It's em embraced and, and agreed to by the Senate. And so he's Princip Principus uh, Civiatus. He'll eventually become, um, he'll eventually come into power. And he will eventually take the name Augustus and he'll take the title of Caesar. But that'll happen in 27 BC. So as you can see here, the just from the map, there are, there are different degrees in which there were uh, provinces and there were territories that were being brought into the Roman Empire. Well, you look over where uh, at the tail, the east side of the Mediterranean, where Israel was. Um, there was a famous census that Caesar Augustus suggested for identifying for military, for finance, for. Um, trade for a variety of different reasons as the kingdom was expanding. 
he, he did more than just this one census, but this famous one that is depicted by uh, Luke was happening at the time that Rome was transitioning from being a republic to being an empire and being ro ruled by an emperor who has then gone from Gaius Octavian to Principus Civiatus to now Caesar Augustus. And so the concept, if I go back to our... Um, to our look here, the concept of doing a census wasn't uncommon, and it made sense as to why he would have done that for the Roman Empire that was beginning. Well, coming back to our context, Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem in the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him was expecting a child. And what will happen from this is uh, the famous Christmas story that, that you and I know about. Baby being born, wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, no room for them in the local inn. There's going to be shepherds in the fields. They're going to be visited by angels. There's going to be an announcement that today in the city of David or the town of David, a Savior's been born. Um, and so you have in verse 10, the angel said to them, being to the shepherds, uh, don't be afraid. I bring you good news, a great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born, Jesus Christ the Lord. Now keep in mind, where this is happening is about, let's call it about two miles, a little over two miles outside of Bethlehem. There's a very common area called the Shepherd's Field. I've had the privilege of being there twice. Um, it is a definitive location outside of Bethlehem, but if you were to say, where's the shepherd's field? It's so close. You would say it's in Bethlehem. It's right next to Bethlehem. And so these shepherds are hearing this news that a savior has been born and, uh, and they're to go find this child in the town of David, which was right there in Bethlehem. This will be assigned to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. We know that they're going to find this family. There's going to be celebration. The shepherds are going to communicate what had happened to them by way of appearance of the angels. And uh, there's going to be a celebration by both Mary and uh, the shepherds. And then it says in verse 20, uh, that the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Now, from that, then we're jumping ahead to a couple of days, just let's call it a week's time. In verse 21 through 40, Jesus presented in the temple on the eighth day when it was time to circumcise him. So Bethlehem is just outside of Jerusalem. It's a less than seven mile journey. Would not have been a very arduous journey to go to the temple. And uh, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So once again, she's recovering in Bethlehem. It's not a far journey at all. Um, and uh, they're going to go to Jerusalem. Now, something that follows after this is we're going to see that uh, Mary and Joseph were most likely somewhat poor, if not all the way poor, um, because there's a requirement uh, that I'll push on in a second. As it is written, so they were to come and, and uh, follow the law of Moses. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice. In keeping what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, let me push pause here for just a second. Let me read something from uh, the book of Leviticus. So, the way uh, the book of Exodus ends is God wanting to meet with people. Exodus ends in uh, chapter 40, verse 38. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, and in the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. That's how Exodus ends. Immediately, Leviticus starts, and I've said this before on other teachings, but the book of Levit Leviticus 
takes place in the context of one month. The Lord is going to give his law of Leviticus uh, to Moses within the context of one month. But it says, immediately following the tabernacle being completed, the, law, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. And, and he said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. Now follow that, herd or flock, herd being cattle and bull, flock being lambs, goats, <coughs> And watch this. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, being cattle, uh, he is to offer a male without defect. Now, why do you offer a bull and not a cow? You offer a bull because of the reproduction value. It simply is a higher value. Because with a cow, no reproduction. With the bull, the capacity of reproduction. So God is saying, if you're bringing me an offering, it was the Hebrew word korban, if you're bringing an offering to me, you bring me something of the highest quality. Bring your best. And God always blesses accordingly, but he doesn't want people um, to disgrace him or to minimize their offering to the Lord. Now, it goes on to say in verse 10, if the offering is a burnt offering from the flock. So not everybody has a bull. Not everybody has herds. Not everybody has the resources. So if they have flocks from either the sheep or the goats, he is to offer a male without defect. Same kind of thing. If you don't have the resources of a herd and bulls, fine. But if you have a flock and you have sheep and goats, then you bring a male. Same kind of principle. Now, you keep following to verse 14, and it says, If the offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, he is to offer a dove or a young pigeon. Now, why did God put that in there? Well, the allowance of offerings was that not everybody had herds and not everybody had flocks. Some people were poor and had neither of those. However, the capacity for the poor still remained to be able to get a dove or a pigeon of some sort. Now, you even find this in the grain offering, that God makes an allowance for the poor in the grain that they're allowed to bring. So God is always making room for anybody to be able to come and give offering to him, to give worship to him. For Mary and Joseph, because of what they brought, it's well agreed upon that by their offering that they were poor. Now, whether their family line was poor or whether they had been somewhat banished to poverty because of her being pregnant and this sketchy story of, you know, God did it, th there's debate about that. But we do know that they were not of a high economic position. Now, verse 25 through 35 is going to involve the blessing of an elderly man named Simeon. He's going to be uh, kept alive by the Lord uh, until the coming of the Lord. Uh, we read about that in these verses. And then we also see in verse 36 through 38 that there, there, there's going to be another blessing from a lady this time named Anna. Uh, she was an 84-year-old woman who was a widow of most of her life and lived in the temple praying. And you, you just pause for just a moment. You look at the whole gospel account of Jesus um, from the announcement to Zechariah that also involved Elizabeth and their testimony of themselves is we're well along in years. And then you have Simeon here and then you have Anna in this context. It's just interesting that the Lord's story involves people from shepherds to people who are younger, people who are older, people in lots of different contexts. It really is a mosaic um, of people. So we continue on to verse 41, and Jesus is going to be at the temple. Uh, we know that he's going to be 12 years old. We'll see that in just a moment. But in verse 41 through 52, it says, Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Now, the Jewish people had three primary feasts that they would travel to. They were called pilgrimage feasts. You'd have Passover, and then you'd have Feast of Weeks, and then Feast of Booths. And I'll just kind of say a couple things here. But Passover, reflecting back to the Passover out of the book of Exodus, where God delivers Israel from uh, the Egyptian bondage. 
Now, Feast of Weeks was harvest-based, but it was 50 days. The requirement was 50 days following Passover. And throughout history, you can read it for yourself, throughout history, it is often connected to, the Feast of Weeks is connected to Moses coming onto Mount Sinai and receiving the commandments following the deliverance from Egypt. And so many hold that that, that happened, the, the distribution of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai began uh, 50 days following the Passover. It's also in the New Testament uh, where we would get Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Feast of Booths is also defined as Feast of Tabernacles, and it points to their time following the Lord in the wilderness and God's provision for them in the midst of these tents, these tabernacles uh, that they lived within. But we'll keep going in the context of our story here. So they're in Jerusalem, Feast of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom after the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. They began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Now, pause here. Um, it was common within those, within those pilgrimage feasts to travel in caravan. Safer, cheaper. Um, all males were required. Those that weren't able to call it for health reasons, monetary reasons, is you would send a male representation from your family. But if everybody had the capacity health wise, then they would, they would travel also. Jesus is going to be, uh, in the temple. They're going to caravan away without without knowing that Jesus has uh, not left with them. And it, I mean, you think about the movie Home Alone, you know, where you realize you don't have one of your kids with you. Uh, I'm sure Mary has one of those Home Alone moments. But something just interesting to think about if we keep reading here. Uh, after three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Jesus is going to give answer to this. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And here's what's just interesting to keep in mind about that. In the Jewish context of age, uh, a male... A Jewish male was seen as a man at age 13. And being being seen as a man, then he was then responsible for the same requirements as a 30-year-old man, 50-year-old man. He had to travel to Jerusalem. He had to do these things. 12-year-old was not required for those. So it's my understanding, and uh, it's just my opinion, uh, that the reason that Joseph and Mary aren't looking for him in the temple is because he's not of the age that he would have been found in the temple yet. So it's interesting that uh, that's where he goes. And, uh, and it, it, it's partly why it's even more astonishing is you have a 12-year-old who is not privy to the temple customs, therefore a variety of things for priests, a variety of things for the things of the temple, the history, all of that. And a 12-year-old shows up. I mean, we're talking in athletic terms, it'd be a rookie. A rookie shows up, and he is schooling the veterans. Um, but you go on to chapter 3, and uh, in chapter 3, we're going to have John the Baptist and him preparing the way. Uh, you see here, very similar to how the other chapter started. It's a timeline. It's context of historical timeline. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Uteria, and uh, Trachonitis, I'm probably saying that wrong, and uh, Lysanias, uh, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Ant 
Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the desert. Now that's a mouthful. All of that is timeline. Just like you and I would say in the year 2023, July, and then we would have context. They're using leaders. Now the reason I haven't read Herod Tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip Tetrarch is let me give you something because it's going to show up with with uh, John the Baptist. King Herod, when King Herod died, which was very soon after Jesus was born, and we have now leaped in time because we know that John the Baptist was born before Jesus, you know, six months before Jesus. Now we've jumped ahead in time where John the Baptist is an older guy. He's in his thir- He's probably about 30. Um, because we know the ministry of Jesus begins at 30. So John the Baptist is about 30. We have a 30-year leapfrog of time here from chapter 2 to chapter 3. So things have changed. King Herod has died, and he has left his sons in power, and he has four predominant sons. We're not going to talk about those. We've talked about that in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Mark when we talked about John the Baptist. I'm just highlighting that Luke is pointing to the historical timeline involving the sons of Herod. So keep going because we'll come back to it. He went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, this is happening over in the Jordan Valley. Let me give you a map real quick. Um, Where you have that red X, John the Baptist is in that southern portion of the Jordan River, Jordan Valley, that whole if you can see from the screen, you can probably see the mountain line, ridge lines that run throughout Jerusalem all the way up north towards Syria. And the one on the, what would be the east side, on the east side of the Dead Sea, that's present day Jordan. We hear about present day Jordan in the news. That would be where you are seeing Edom and Moab, Moab and Ammon. Um, And John the Baptist is in that southern portion of the Jordan River in the Jordan Valley. Now, uh, let me show you something. Uh, I took this photo the last time we were in Israel. I'm standing on Mount Nebo in the Jordan Territory, looking out over the Jordan Valley, somewhere down in between where you have the Jordan Valley, you know, line towards Dead Sea is the area that most scholars hold that John the Baptist would have been. The Jordan the Jordan River comes out of the Galilee area. See Galilee over on the east side. It's actually going north in in the context of this photo. This photo shouldn't be seen as east and west, but you know, north and south. Galilee's north, Jerusalem south. And uh, the Jordan River flows down towards the Dead Sea. John the Baptist would have been down there in that Jordan Valley area. And he's down there baptizing. I'm going to hop back to our look. He's down there baptizing, and people were coming to him, many who were listening and responding, and many were who were opposing. So the people were waiting expectantly, were all were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered all of them. Uh, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then there's opposition, and here's where we get why Luke adds not just the context of time, but also to add this, because Matthew talks about, Mark talks about, when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added them, added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Now let me talk about that for a second. What Luke does here is he is writing contextually, given an orderly account, and then he pauses and he talks about something that will happen in the days ahead. So where you see verse 19 and 20, it is not happening chronologically. But he is letting the reader know 
that this is the John that Herod the Tetrarch had the big problem with. Now, why did he have the big problem with? And why was John arrested and ultimately ends up being beheaded? We know the story of that reading from the book of Matthew and book of Mark. Well, because after King Herod had died, he had given his son's power, four predominant sons, and um, two of them uh, got into a very complicated, uh, intense, sinful problem. So you had one brother, Philip, who was married to a girl named Herodias. And then Herod, the Tetrarch, the Tetrarch was just a region. It's like, a, it was, it's just a statement about what they ruled over. This Herod ends up leaving his wife to take Philip's wife. Herodias leaves her husband to join with her, what would have been brother-in-law. And, and as Wheel's office this is, there were a lot of people that celebrated it and didn't speak out because they didn't want the, the backlash and the ramifications of speaking out against Herod's family. So this is going to be so corny, but let me just give you a, a visual of this. So we're all familiar with the Flintstones. So let's say, for instance, Barney Rubble and Fred Flintstone were brothers. So we just, we're going to imagine that they're brothers. Fred and Barney are brothers. But we know Fred is with Wilma and Barney is with Betty. That's just how the Flintstones roll. But let's say, for instance, Fred starts getting eyes for Betty and he kicks Wilma to the curb and Betty kicks Barney to the curb. And now the new story is Fred and Betty. We would say, in the context of Flintstones, that doesn't work at all. We'd say that's wrong. That can't be celebrated. Well, that's exactly what happened up here with Herod's family. One brother gets rid of his wife. Herodias gets rid of Philip. And they became a couple. And many people celebrated it or were quiet about it, except for John the Baptist. And he said, this is wrong, it's evil. He called him out and he would eventually be arrested for it and eventually be beheaded for it. Now, coming back to uh, our, our verses, in verse 21 through 38, you're going to have the baptism and the genealogy of Jesus. We're not going to unpack the verses of that. Um, the genealogy, I will just say the only ones to give genealogy are Matthew and Luke. Uh, the difference is that Matthew's uh, is being written to a Jewish audience who are, who are hearing about Jesus being the Messiah. So it must go from Abraham, and it must go through David. So uh, if you'd like to listen to that, we, we dealt with that uh, over in the early portions of the Gospel of Matthew. To me, Matthew chapter 1 and the genealogy is one of the most fascinating portions of the New Testament. I think it is so rich with history and why Matthew wrote what he wrote. Uh, I, I would take too much time to, to try and add all the value to it right here. Luke takes a different stance because he's not writing to a Jewish audience about Jesus as Messiah. He's writing about Jesus being the Son of Man. So he starts with Jesus and works back to Adam. So they have different context in how they're trying to write um, the particular genealogy. Um, but if we take that over to uh, chapter 4, this is what we see in chapter 4, um, you know, four breakouts. And um, from the temptation of Jesus, him and Nazareth, cast out an evil spirit, and then uh, his ministry of healing will just go uh, bananas, so to say. Uh, verse 14 through 30, he's going to be rejected at Nazareth. Uh, verse 16 simply says he went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Um, <coughs> 
The term synagogue is something that literally meant assembly. We'll push on it more as we get into Capernaum. We've unpacked this in previous studies, but but if you've never been in any of our studies before, I'll unpack what a synagogue was and how they operated and why they had them um, as we get further into the study of, of uh, Luke. But he goes into the synagogue that or assembly location, like town hall, uh, that would have been in Nazareth. He stood up to read. It's kind of how the setting was. Chairs around the outer portions. Guests could get up and read scrolls. He stands up. He's going to read from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. This is coming out of Isaiah chapter 61. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he's going to stop. Verse 20 is going to say that he's going to roll up the scroll and he's going to give it back and he's going to sit down. Now, the one thing that I would just add is as we see this fantastic, testimony of the ministry of Jesus. We still see him doing all of these things today. Once again, this is coming from the scroll Isaiah 61, what we would have is chapter 61. There is one statement Jesus did not read. There is the very end where it has to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There is in Isaiah 61, one more statement. I'll show it to you. In Isaiah 61, the last part of verse 2 says, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, Jesus doesn't include that. Now, why? Because that statement historically from Isaiah and other prophets is connected to the second coming of the Lord. To what is called the day of the Lord, the end times. So it's interesting that he reveals in Luke, he reveals the top portion of Isaiah 61 for his ministry, and knowing that this portion, the day of vengeance of our God, awaits a fulfillment at the end of days. So he then rolls up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, they're going to have a huge response to this in uh, thinking that he is blaspheming, uh, blaspheming the scriptures, blaspheming Israel, and they're going to try to attempt to kill him. They're going to try and rush him off of what in, in Nazareth is a hill cliff called uh, Mount Precipice, and uh, they're going to try and rush him off of that. He is going to disappear from them. And uh, then we'll find Jesus picking up in verse 31. Uh, he is going to go to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum, if my math is, is correct, it's about 11 miles. Uh, Capernaum is about 11 miles from Nazareth. So it's up north in the Galilee region also. Um, I've just given you just a sample of verses here. There's more. I just wanted to try and put it all on one, one slide. Then he went down to Capernaum. Jumping ahead in verse 31, he began to teach the people. Verse 32, they were amazed at his teaching. He's going to have a man who's possessed by a demon who's going to cry out the top of his voice. He's going to say some things about Jesus, but Jesus is going to sternly stop him and say, come out of him. The man's going to be delivered and the people are going to be amazed by this. And uh, news will begin to spread about him throughout all the area, not just Capernaum, but the whole Galilee territory. And so what follows is the last section of chapter two, or chapter four, and that will be that uh, Jesus will leave the synagogue, he will go to Peter's house, he will heal Peter's mother-in-law, and then there will be an event that night where many, many people are gathered in Capernaum around the house and there are many healings that are taking place. And the ministry of Jesus begins to thrive uh, at just, you know, uncommon ways and numbers. And it's with that that uh, chapter four uh, comes to a close. Now, once again, as always, I hope that this has been helpful kind of as an overview. Maybe there have been some things that you're like, huh, I didn't know that about that timeline or about that situation. 
most definitely would love to have you read the, the passages for yourself, rest on them. But always remember this, even if you don't know the history of an event, it doesn't make the scriptures less accurate, less powerful for you. So don't ever, ever, ever think, well, just because I don't know the history then maybe I can't fully receive. That's not true at all, because the author of the scripture, not Luke, but the Holy Spirit, is with you, and he'll teach you his word, and he'll make his word reside in the depth of your heart. I hope this study's been helpful, and I hope that you can uh, join me again for part three of our study of Luke. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.